Hello, everyone. How are you all doing? Good? Jacked up on caffeine? Um, right, this is a very, very big stage. Uh, okay. I'm going to be talking with you today for the next 30 minutes about five of the psychological principles behind persuasive product design. Um, let's see if this clicker works. Does it want to work? I think we need to get an extra clicker. Had this problem in rehearsal. So, okay, if you want to tweet to me, because this is going to be quite fast and furious, you can tweet to me at Natalie Nahai. I've also included a link for you to download the slides at the end of the presentation. So don't feel like you have to frantically scribble notes if you just want to sit back and enjoy this. Right, so the first principle I'd like us to look at is endowed progress. Two psychologists randomly decided to distribute 300 loyalty cards to customers at a car wash. Now, half of them got this. So let's say you guys over here, you're group A, you're going to get this stamp where you get eight stamps to get a free car wash. Yay! You guys over here, you're going to get this one. So you have to collect 10 stamps to get a free car wash. But when they hand you over the stamp, you've already got two punched out. My question to you is this. Which group, group A over here with the eight, or group here, over, uh, group here with the 10, had the highest redemption rate? This one? Hands up if you think it's this one. You're too smart for your own good. Or hands up if you think it's this one. OK, you smarty pants. Right, so yes, the redemption rate for the people in the eight, ta eight stamp category was 19%. So 19% of them came back and used the offer, which is quite high. But it was almost doubled by people in group B, the 10 stamps. So what happened? They'd mapped the task requiring eight steps into a task requiring 10, where two of the steps had already been completed. So what the psychologists had essentially done was to reframe the task, objectively exactly the same thing that everyone was required to do, so that the people with the 10 stamps had perceived the task as already undertaken, but incomplete. And what you find is this also works in bizarre ways online. We're all familiar with these pop-ups. Oh, I hate pop-ups. This is a website that's run by a friend of mine, and it's called Silicon Reel. You go online, you have a look at videos of people in the tech world. But what you'll find is it's not your average pop-up. If you look to the top section, you'll see a little green progress bar. And it says 50% complete. Now, I don't know about you, but pop-ups are really annoying. None of us actively engage to get the shit to come up. It just comes up, and then you're like, click away, click away. So you haven't had to do anything for this 50% completion bar to show up. And yet, because you get this sense of, oh, I've started, so I might as well carry on, and this is mostly subconscious, you're much more likely to click through and give your email. So how does it work? Well, endowed progress is essentially the situation where people provided with artificial advancement toward a goal exhibit greater persistence. They're much more likely to work harder towards reaching that goal. Make sense so far? Yeah? OK. So basically, we're naturally motivated to complete tasks that we've started. And once we've got that, originally, uh, that original intention, whether you've taken the intention to start or whether someone gives you the intention, i.e. the two punches, you're much more likely to start running with it and go, well, I'm just going to stay consistent with that original incentive. Does that make sense? OK. The other thing, not just consistently, the other thing that's really interesting with this is that the closer we get to the goal, so the closer the steps are to the end, the more likely we are to finish and to continue until we get over that line. Now, these triggers are really interesting principles, but they're very easy to build in to your products. So giving people just a little flimsy piece of card with two holes punched in was enough to trigger both the consistency and the proximity effects required to get people that sense of endowed progress. I've started, so therefore I'll continue until I end. What's interesting for this is in terms of product design, it allows you to do two key things. First of all, it increases the likelihood that people will complete the task that you've given them. So that could be sign up, it could be inputting information, and the second thing that it does is it reduces the completion time. So if you want to get people in and get them to complete processes more quickly, which most of us do, this is a really good way of helping you achieve that goal. And there's another thing I want to touch on here as well, which is this idea that's taken from Kahneman and Tversky's prospect theory. And it's the idea that losses loom larger than gains. I'll explain what this means. Basically, we tend to feel a greater sense of uh, loss over something that we've owned or we think is ours than something we haven't yet bought. 
But there's a weird hack with this kind of stuff. I don't know if you've ever had this on eBay. I stopped using eBay for quite a while now, but the last thing I bought on eBay was a pair of taxidermied magpie wings. Which I know, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, guys. You're like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? I was designing a really cool hat for a party, and I'd got the hats, and I'd found these wings. It was from a guy in Chichester, a farmer. Uh, and they looked really beautiful, you know, they weren't sort of all maggoty and gross. They were nice wings, so I was, I was getting, no one else was bidding on it, obviously. Who's going to bid on a pair of magpie wings apart from Mrs. over here? So I was bidding on them for about a week, I was the lead bidder, I was like, great, I'd designed the hat, I'd bought the hat, I knew exactly how it was going to go, what outfit I was going to use, and it got to the last five minutes, and someone else outbid me. I was like, shit, why is this person outbidding me? Now, here's the crucial thing, I'm a psychologist, I know these principles that are at play. I, only pay, I was only going to pay a certain amount for these wings, but I'd already identified as their owner. I'd designed the hat, I knew who I was going to go to the party with, how cool it would be, and so I was determined to get these wings. They'd gone up in value because of the endowment effect and because I didn't want to lose out. And so I was willing to pay over and above what they were actually worth because they felt like they were mine and I didn't want to lose. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Right, that's principle number one. Uh, and it also works in, in gaming, and that leads us nicely to principle number two, which is sunk cost fallacy. So, how many of you play games? All right, how many of you don't play games, but you play Angry Birds and other things like this? Okay, <laughs> right, me too. So, uh, so players basically are much more likely to return to a game such as Farmville when they've got something that's been endowed to them uh, that they need to take care of or to recuperate as opposed to things that they might just have been given for free and that they don't value as much. Now, if we were to, to believe that we make choices in a rational, logical way, we'd say that a rational player would ignore the sunk cost. So a sunk cost is you're spending time or money or effort, and as soon as it doesn't become worth it anymore, you just go, fuck it, it's fine, I'm going to walk away. But this is not what actually happens in real life. It's very hard to walk away from a sunk cost, so throwing good money after bad, that kind of idea. And what you find is in the real world, real players are very reluctant to discontinue something that they've already put effort into, which is why this sort of thing works, and nudges like these tend to be very effective. Farmville, nice little bit of tomatoes, you're going to harvest them. And the reason it works is because the sunk cost of having spent time planting these things increases your desire to come back. There's also a whole bunch of other stuff like social dynamics, your friends are doing it, so there's reinforcement from there too. But for the purposes of this, the sunk cost. Okay, so this gives rise to yet another dynamic that's worth you knowing about. And that's the principle of the appointment dynamic. Are you with me so far? All right. So basically, this is where you say to people, right, you're a player, you're engaging in our product or our game, and at a particular time, you're going to come back to participate in the game, and you're going to get something positive like a reward. Um, and this basically gets people coming back for more, creating a habitual pattern of use. And it's the kind of game that we play every morning when before we do anything else, you grab your phone and you look at your screen and you see those little red invitations to check your email, check your Twitter, check your Facebook. That's what keeps us coming back for more. And I want to talk a little bit briefly about how these work together. So first of all, endowed progress. You help your customers begin. You give them artificial advancement towards a goal, whatever that goal might be. Once you've done that, and they've got that intention and they're engaged, the consistency principle kicks in, and they're much more likely to follow along that initial desire to complete said goal. By that point, once the consistency has got them to come back in, to spend time, to spend money, to spend effort, they've already sunk that cost, they've already spent that time, that money, that effort, and that encourages further investment because they don't want to lose what they've already invested. At that point, you give them a reason to come back. The appointment dynamic comes in, and that's when you start to create a habitual use, so through reinforcement. If you want to use this, the first thing to do, which is, I'm sure, something that you will do anyway, is to research what motivates your users. Also, psychologically, what kind of emotional or psychological payoff are they getting from engaging with you? Is it maybe intrinsic motivation? It's, it's fun in and of itself. Or is it extrinsic? They're actually going to get something like, I don't know, a loyalty reward or financial benefits, like prizes. Once you've understood what's motivating them, you can give them relevant initial progress. Decide exactly what thing to give them for free, so it could be points, it could be upgrades, virtual currency, which we'll look at in a minute, or potential products. And you can use these and map out the user journey so that you're creating a system that's much more engaging and fun for them, and that gets people through quicker, which saves you time and money. The fourth principle I want to discuss with you is opportunity cost. 
So, imagine that we're transported magically into San Francisco, and I give you each, because I'm wealthy and fabulous and I'm a billionaire, which I'm not, but let's just pretend, I give you each 100 bucks to spend, okay? Now, which of the following would you choose? I have limited your choice somewhat for the purposes of this interaction. Number one, you buy some clothes. Number two, you take your mates out for a drink. Or number three, you save it for a rainy day. So, hands up if you go for number one. Okay, oh, you're all clothed, probably don't need it as much. It's a nice little sort of treat. Number two, mates for a drink. Of course, we're in England. I did this in San Francisco. They're like, no, 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 we're going to save. I'm like, what, what are you doing? Uh, but of course, if we saved in the UK for a rainy day, it would be this afternoon, so then you take your mates out for a drink. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't, doesn't quite work. So fuck it, let's just say you take your mates out for a drink. Now, how did you decide to make this decision? Your resources are limited. You have three options, and your resources are 100 bucks. How do you decide what to choose? So you probably weigh up the decision uh, and the value of each alternative. So you go, 100 bucks, mm, I don't really need to buy any more clothes because I've got some, or that's not enough to buy the kind of clothes I want to get, so I'm not going to do that. I might not go for any day, as I, I described, so we'll just spend it on fun. But what's interesting is that the principle here, opportunity cost, refers to the benefits that we forego for a particular use of resources. So if we choose to go out drinking with our mates, that 100 bucks is spent on that. So we can't spend it on the other two things. That's the cost of taking that single opportunity. So it's basically what you're giving up by making a particular choice. So the way this works is such. There are three main costs that I want to bring your attention to right now that are relevant for what you guys do. The first is the cost of attention. The second is the cost of time. And the third is the cost of money. So let's look at the cost of attention. I'm sure you hear this a lot, it really bugs me. People keep saying, oh, we're in a time and attention economy. Well, of course we are, we're all gonna die at some point. But the point is that attention, when you're trying to grab it online, is becoming increasingly limited and fragmented and therefore very valued. So how can you grab and hold attention? If you're competing with all these other people and all these other services and products, you need to be the one that gets this right. So one way to do this is to trigger an emotional or arousal response. Now, research has found in neuropsychological studies that when you look at people who have brain lesions, so damage to the areas in the brain that allow people to make emotional decisions or emotional processing, and you give them an option, for instance, something like, do you want coffee or do you want tea? They would be able to list to you exactly why you should take coffee or tea, but when you give them the physical choice, they can't make the decision even though it's something fairly banal. And this points towards emotion as being the primary mover of any decision that we make. So if you can create a product that initiates that sort of reaction, people are much more likely to act. And this is why things like this tend to work quite well. You've got the emotional response, there's a little hossy, uh, I've got the match, if there's someone that I like but likes me back, there's that arousal that kicks in, and so you're much more likely to become a habitual user, shall we say, of this and other similar platforms. Another way to hold attention is to serve a fundamental human need, and there are many of these, so I'll just focus on one. So this idea of social validation, that all of us here today, we want to be accepted and admired and liked by our peers, especially those people that we deem to be similar to ourselves or that we hold in high esteem. And this works online. It's one of the founding principles behind the success of many social platforms, including Facebook with a like, that's an endorsement, someone likes me, or the retweets or the favorites or whatever it might be. The other way to grab and hold attention, and this is where we sort of move towards the dark side a little bit, is to create a variable ratio of reward. Now, what happens when you get a sense of reward? Say, for instance, you're, you're dancing, or you're doing something that you find really pleasurable, you're singing, you're having sex, or you're doing cocaine. All of these things trigger... I, no, I'm not saying... I'm not endorsing the use of cocaine. <laughs> Oh, that came out the wrong way. I practiced this, and the sentence was going to come out differently. Anyway, the point is, when you do any of these things, they trigger a neurochemical response in the brain, which releases dopamine, and this is kind of known as the reward chemical, uh, which is why people can get hooked on certain things. I'm not endorsing it. But what you can do with products is if you give people small rewards, and they don't know when they're going to get them, or how big they're going to be, their dopamine levels will spike every time they get one of those, and they'll be much more likely to keep hunting for that kick. So you end up in what's called a dopamine loop. So you kind of think, oh, well, on this Twitter stream, I'm going to keep going until I get that like, until I get a, a tweet that's really lovely, or until I get that email saying that I've got a promotion or whatever it is. And so we're caught in this sort of habitual self-interruption loop because we're getting that attention triggered all of the time. OK, let's talk about the cost of time and how to minimize this in your products. So I want to ask you again, when do you use these following products and possibly why do you use them? The first is Netflix. So hands up who uses Netflix. 
Okay, so most of us, a lot of us at least. When do you typically use Netflix? Shout it out. Evening? Pretty much most of us would say evening. All right, so when we have some downtime. What about Reddit? Hands up if you use Reddit. Okay, when do you use Reddit? Let's get a couple of answers here. <laughs> Who said at work? You naughty boys. Why do you use it at work? Oh, oh, now. See, it's all right if you're anonymous, as soon as you get the finger pointed. I, had, I did this, a similar talk to this in, in uh, the Habit Summit in Stanford. And uh, someone said, when I'm on the loo, you're like, right, what were you checking that was, anyway. The point is, you tend to use it when you're a little bit frustrated or you've got a little pocket of time and you want to have a few giggles. Um, and what's interesting here is that to get people to use your product, you have to minimize time cost. So, you can minimize the cost of spending time with you by doing several things. By understanding, first of all, people's incentives for using your product. And one of the things that I find really interesting here is that when you're talking about apps in particular, some research came out from Nielsen last year, it was in the third quarter of 2014, that found that the top three reasons that people use apps on their mobile devices and tablets and stuff were all relating to being bored and or alone. So people are constantly seeking stimulation. I made the point about the dopamine loops. This is something that people are actively seeking. You can also minimize time costs by understanding people's usage patterns so that you can optimize your product to fit those patterns really well. Uh, there's a particular app that seems to be quite good for this. Friends of mine have referred me onto it, Flurry by Yahoo. And then once you have this analytics data, you can then decide how to specifically target these packets of time. Things like when you're on the tube. When you look at people on the tube, they're usually, play, usually playing some sort of silly game like Candy Crush or whatever it is, because they've got 15 minutes to kill. Maybe at work. Researchers found that on Wednesday afternoons between three and four, lots of people go online and do shopping. Why? Because they're bored and they're either way really quite far from the weekends. It's you know, a way to alleviate depression. Um, or also, for instance, we heard this morning about Spotify. When you're running and you're at the gym, you could use that app, for instance. The third cost that I want to talk with you is a really important one, and that's the cost of money. Research has found that when we pay for stuff, especially when it's physical money, or when we see, for instance, on a restaurant bill, a money sign, so a pound sign or dollar sign, whatever it is, that it activates the same regions of the brain that get activated when we're in physical pain. Right? <laughs> which is why when you have to pay someone a whole bunch of money, it's much, much easier if you don't have any dollar signs in front of it, which is also what you find in um, restaurants, especially the high-end ones. They won't have any signs. I'll just say 140 or 300 or whatever it is for wines. I, yes, anyway, so just put a, put a figure in front of it and then you'll be much less likely to just part with your cash. So, cost of money. It's an important one. So I want you to think about how these following products reduce the perceived cost of paying. So first of all, we have Clash of Clans. Does anyone play this? Some of you? You're the reason that I get to spend zero time with my husband because you're all beating him on this game. Clash of Clans, where you get to do weird shit with your friends and try and raid each other's camps, basically. I know it's actually quite fun, so please don't hit me. But it tends, takes a lot of time out. And it's also very social. The other one that you might be familiar with, SimCity. Uh, and they also have an interesting way of reducing the perceived cost of playing. One of the things that they both do is they, they create this kind of thing called fun pain, which I'm sure you'll be familiar with, especially with Clash of Clans, where you basically have to wait for something to be built or for something to get raided. And then you're sitting there with your mates going, what's happening? Didn't, why didn't you shore up the walls of our clan thing with dragons and crazy stuff? Um, and that'll, that'll be 20 minutes of just, you're just sat there glued to your screen playing that product. And what the smarter products will do, or games will do, is to help you resolve this fun pain, this pain of waiting, by giving you the opportunity to buy out of it, buy your way out. So they're sort of fighting pain with pain. And in SimCity, you do this by buying this thing called Bliss. But how do you value Bliss? We don't pay for stuff in Bliss. You don't get onto the tube and go, yes, I'll pay for my tube journey with Bliss. So the point is that we can't. Instead, we have to use gems, which is an intermediate currency, to then trade for Bliss. And what's nice about this, in terms of psychological optimization of this particular journey, they have pre-selected, very helpfully, the most expensive option. And what you'll find is that if you do this for people, and I don't advocate this because sometimes people hate it, obviously, um, is that we're very reluctant, once we're given an option, to move away from it, even if it's the most expensive selected. So they're pretty cheeky. Anyway, what research has found is that adding just one intermediate currency between the real money, so your hard-earned cash, and whatever it is you're trying to purchase, can really confound people's ability to assess the real value of the transaction. 
There are other ways to do this in a more ethical way. So allowing people to earn currency slowly can also reduce the true cost of paying, as well as offering bulk, bulk discounts and stuff like that. Um, so to re reduce the perceived cost of money, if this is something that you want to do, I would recommend that you use fun pain, which can be waiting. It's also gamifying the whole experience. You can use an intermediate currency. Don't do it punitively. <laughs> And you can also allow people to earn currency, but quite slowly, in order to get them to come through, as well as offering bulk discounts. The fifth and final principle that I want to talk to you about, and this is my favorite one, is called hedonic adaptation. Has anyone heard of this? Some of us, okay, a few, brilliant. Right, so I'm gonna pretend again, you guys, group A, I'm gonna duplicate myself in a special Star Trek machine, and you're gonna get 180 seconds of massage each. I'm actually very good at it, so yay. You guys over here, you're gonna get a little bit less, I'm sorry. You're going to get 80 seconds of massage, 20 seconds of break, and then another 80 seconds of massage, right? Okay. So in total, you get two minutes uh, and 40 seconds. Now, which group do you think will report a higher satisfaction from that massage, bearing in mind if I give everyone the same one, and would be willing to pay more for it? Hands up if you think that it's group A who get three full minutes. This happens every time, because you know by now that it's a trick. All right, group B. Fine, yes, well done. some are undecided. Okay, fine. Anyway, yes, basically Group B, who have a shorter amount of time overall, uh, and took a break. Why? I'm gonna ask you, because you're such a smart audience, why do you think you guys would pay more for it? They've experienced the loss. Probably. Excellent, yes, they've experienced the loss. And what the researchers actually found was that a short break stimmies your adaptation response. So the hedonic adaptation to that particular experience kind of gets reset. So you have the massage, oh, this is so nice, this is so nice. You experience the loss, and then, oh, I've lost it again. And then you get it again, and it's like, oh, yeah, it's really nice. Anyway, this also happens for really unpleasant experiences. And the research findings were duplicated with like, loud noises from Hoovers. Uh, so if you take a break, it sucks more. It's also the reason why, if you're sitting in a room and your flatmate farts, and then you leave the room, and then you come back in. It's even more gross when you come back in, because you've reset. <laughs> Just saying. So if you're going to fart, try and make sure the person doesn't leave. <laughs> oh, dear. This is why I have no friends. OK, so <laughs> it's the same thing with products. Uh, so OK, so how many of us have played Angry Birds? Most of us have. I have, right? So it's exciting. The Angry Birds come out. Oh my god, what is it? I'll play it. Excitement. It's new. Everyone's doing it. You're starting with a high engagement rate. Over time, you're going through all the levels, you kind of start to get bored, and so you stop. So what do they do? Oh my god, we've got a new one. We've got Angry Birds season. So it's exciting, and it's fairly new. So you start going again, and eventually you start to adapt, and so you stop. So they bring out another one, and you start to see the pattern, you guys. So it's kind of going from this point of high excitement, high engagement, high pleasure with novelty. Over time, you become adapted to that stimulus, and so you drop off. So what, what's really interesting with habitually used products and games and apps and services is that they're trying to get you, or they're able to get you, in this high arousal state up there. So you're continually engaged, and they're hacking your hedonic adaptation response. Make sense? Yeah, nods? Great. OK, so how does it work? Well, basically, people become accustomed to a positive or a negative stimulus, so massage versus stinky farts, uh, and the response is attenuated over time. So basically, we become desensitized. Now, what's interesting here is there's seven th several things that you can do um, to use the hacks to stop this drop-off in your customers. But you have to be very careful with this. As you heard from Jared this morning, you can end up in feature hell if you don't use this properly. So for instance, updating products so that people feel there's a bit of novelty, but not so much that you increase their cognitive load and they find it too difficult and they drop off. The second is to change the layout and structure a little bit. If you do this too much, for instance, this happened uh, with eBay a few years ago, they wanted to change the background from, I think it was from yellow to white, and they had a very strong early adoption kind of uh, community, and they did it overnight, and everyone hated it, and so they had to revert it back. So what they did was they took 40 days to gradually sort of change the color from blue to, uh, so sorry, yellow, yellow to slightly less yellow, until eventually after 40 days it was white, so no one noticed the change, they didn't get upset. Anyway, so you can do it in quite sort of subtle ways. You can also alter the user experience, or my preferred method, which is the least risky, is to make the rewards unpredictable. So special treats, special delighters here and then. So some key takeaways then. Number one, the most important. If you want to understand your customers and you want to design products that are persuasive, you have to be able to figure out what the psychological triggers are and to understand the context, so the biases, the motivations that underpin their behaviors, why they're engaging with you. 
So endowed progress, remembering that giving people a little bit of artificial advancement towards a goal triggers their ability to continue to feel like they want to put in that extra effort. Sunk cost fallacy, people are unwilling usually to abandon something they've already invested in. The third one, once you've got them into that consistent use, give them an appointment at a time at which you're going to reward them for engaging with your product. The fourth, make sure that you're reducing the perceived cost of time, of attention, and of money. And finally, try and find ways, and you've got to test this quite subtly, but if you can do it well, it's really good. Try and find ways to hack the natural hedonic adaptation process. Now, in all of these talks, when we're talking about influencing behaviors, there's one crucial point that we often forget. We always talk about users, but actually, when I'm sitting here chatting with you and listening to your talks, you know, as you've spoken earlier and heard people speak and discussions around the break, we are, in fact, all the users. Whatever products we design, whatever becomes best practice, then influences the kind of products that we're constantly engaging with on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I think it's useful to think, whenever you're using these sorts of persuasion principles, where do you sit on the continuum between facilitation at one end, where you're helping users to achieve their goals, versus coercion on the other? So on the one hand, you have persuasion, the other, oops, excuse me, manipulation. And it's quite a fine line to tread. And I actually, I asked the, uh, the ex of the head of the behavioral analysis unit at the FBI. I don't know how I met him, but I did. And I said to him, what do you find to be the difference between persuasion and manipulation? And he said that the difference is intent. If you can have an intent for mutual benefit, so your customers benefit, and you benefit from whatever behavioral insights you're applying to make that journey easier and more fluid, then that's a win. So as designers of products, you're both the architects and the users of all of our future tech. So I'd like to leave you with this question. What kind of world would you like to build? Thank you very much for your time. If you want to find out more. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if you want to find out more, you can check out the book. You can also grab the slides here. It's all lowercase. I've also tweeted it out automatically. Um, so you can grab these. Uh, there, you can get in touch, tweet to me. Uh, you can also check out all the papers and the studies that I've cited directly if you want to do a bit of research. And also, I would invite you, if you're interested in figuring out how to harness persuasive tech and products for good, you're very welcome to check out my not-for-profit event that I'm going to be running again next year. Thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure.